start with Rob Hart, whose book is called The Warehouse. It is thankfully a novel um, <laughs> <laughs> so far. Um, and uh, he is actually a publisher at mysteriouspress.com and the class director at Lit Reactor. Uh, previously, he's been a political reporter, the communications director for a politician, and the commissioner for the city of New York. He lives in Staten Island with his wife and daughter. Rob is the author of the Ash McKenna Crime Series, which is published by Polis, or <coughs> Polis Books, and the short story collection Takeout, um, and co-author of a Kindle single, Scott Free, with James Patterson. So, I got to read a little bit of the book, and uh, it is creepily familiar. Uh, what can you tell us, just set up, set up a little bit what you're, what you're getting at with um, yeah, uh, the warehouse imagines a totally fictional company, not based on any real company in the world. That is like the biggest online retailer. Uh, again, totally fictional. That that completely takes over the American retail economy, but then also builds a live-work facility. So you don't just work there; you also live there, uh, which is sort of similar to the Foxconn model in Asia, and now like Facebook is exploring, and, and Foxconn is actually scouting locations in the U.S. Yes, about. Yeah, so yeah, Blake Crouch said um, the warehouse is a thrilling story of corporate espionage at the highest level, but dig a little deeper and you'll find a terrifying cautionary tale of the nightmare world we are making for ourselves. Uh, one of the things about your book is that your characters aren't like really simplistic. Here's the good guy, here's the bad guy. So I think probably people are thinking so the bad guy is the, um, the person who created this. Uh, thing that became the cloud. Can you talk about that character a little bit? Yeah, uh, so the the book opens with the head of cloud, who's sort of, sort of like a messianic, like Steve Jobs-like figure, uh, Gibson Wells, announcing that he has pancreatic cancer and he's going to die. And this is, an, and that's like the first three lines of the book, so it's not a spoiler. Um, but it's this humongous shift in the American economy because this guy who literally runs it now is, is going to be gone soon. And you know, I'm sort of fascinated by this idea of, of these tech guys who decide, you know, because I'm successful, I'm right. You know, like everything I did was okay, even if I exploited my workers, even if I took advantage of people, even if I destroyed other businesses in the course of what I was doing, I must be right because Mike makes right. And it was it was fun to play with that sort of feeling of giving him the opportunity to talk about why he did what he did and sort of defend himself and then let the reader kind of look at it and say, okay, maybe, but I'm not sure. Yeah. And uh, talk about your other, could you talk about your other two characters a little bit? There's um, come there initially for different reasons and then stuff happens. Yeah. Uh, so so there, there, there are three narrative voices. One is Gibson, uh, the other is Paxton, who is a former prison guard who runs his own business. He, he leaves the prison to run a business, he's so excited, and then the business gets destroyed by this fictional company because they keep on demanding steeper and steeper discounts until he can't actually operate anymore. So he has no other options and has to go work for them. And so he's not thrilled because he's basically going back to a place where he's working security, which is something that he always hated. And the other character is Zinnia, who is a woman who gets hired to work in the warehouse facility, like picking items to, to go out and be shipped out. But uh, she has a little bit of an agenda. She's actually a corporate spot. And she got hired to figure out something about the company that they're trying to keep secret. And Paxton kind of takes a liking to her, and she realizes, hey, the security guard who thinks I'm hot might be helpful to me. So, the, the book kind of explores their relationship where he's kind of falling in love with her and she's sort of trying to figure out how to use him to get to the inside of the facility. Do you, um, one more, one more. Do you, how did, how, uh, in the process of writing this, did you um, creep yourself out in the end or, or what did you uh, kind of come away with feeling that, impressed your, you about the process of creating this book? Here, here, here's the thing that creeped me out. Um, <laughs> the, the, the research, you know, it reinforced a lot of things that I kind of knew, like from being a reporter and then from working in politics. Like you see how people with money basically get to rewrite the rule book. Uh, what creeped me out is that there was stuff I was making up in this book and then 
like six months later, like even after it got picked up, we were seeing like, uh, like, like this company has bank accounts for its employees. And I think like three months after the book got published, Amazon was talking about opening up checking accounts for its employees. You know, my agent keeps on doing this. Like he'll see something, he's like, hey, you wrote about this several months ago. Why is it coming true now? Um, but then also uh, something that's really gratifying too is that there are a lot, uh, I, I don't know if anyone's seen the, the movie Sorry to Bother You, uh, Boo Riley, which was such a great movie. And like 10 minutes into it, me and my wife looked at each other like, what is going on? Because it, it could have been like a bizarro side, like short story in that universe. Uh, in the warehouse universe. So I feel like now is the time to attack late stage capitalism. I feel like my timing was just really good. <laughs> indeed, yeah. indeed. It's a real um, page turner. Um, Thank you. So moving along to a bit of a different um, mood, uh, Saeed, who you can barely see over here. We're going to switch. Uh, <laughs> Oh, he's switching. Okay. We got it. We got it. You sure? Okay. So, Saeed Jones is the author of uh, Prelude to the to Bruise, which is poetry. It is um, published by Coffeehouse Press. It's the winner of the 2015 Penn Joyce Osterwell Award for Poetry and the 2015 Stonewall Book Award, uh, Bar and Barbara Giddings Literature Award, and a finalist for the 2015 National Books. Book Critics Circle Award in Poetry. Uh, How We Fight for Our Lives is his prose debut. Jones is co-host of BuzzFeed's morning show AM to DM, and he previously served as editor of BuzzFeed's LGBT and culture sections, while also helping to launch the BuzzFeed Emerging Writers Fellowship. He has co-hosted the National Book Award finalist readings, reading since 2016, and in 2016 he won the Energizer Award for Exceptional Acts of Literary Citizenship from the community of literary magazines and presses. Born in Memphis, Tennessee, he grew up in Louisville, Texas. He earned a BA at Western Kentucky University and an MFA at Rutgers University, Newark, and he lives in New York City and tweets at the veracity. <laughs> I'm trying to read super fast so we can- You did, that was good, you did you. it, you did it. <laughs> this is a really remarkable memoir that is prose and poetry and um, just crafted as an incredible work of art. Um, from the excerpt that I read, I was struck by the loving and unflinching way that you write about your mother. Um, maybe that's a place to start. I, I you know, I have read uh, Sherman Alexie's You Don't Have to Say You Love Me and Kiese Lehman's mm -hmm. book, yes. and I just felt I, you were uh, easily in that company, and uh, and just the themes of how mothers and sons um, come to terms with one another. Can you talk about that part of your book a little bit? Of course. Thank you. Um, it's it's the greatest compliment uh, to know that you've connected with my mother on the page. Uh, my mom, Carol Jean Sweet Jones, uh, raised me as a single parent in Louisville, Texas, uh, suburb just north of Dallas home of the Louisville High School Fighting Farmers. <laughs> uh, she was Buddhist. Uh, growing up in the Bible be Belt was weird. Um, uh, but she loved me so fiercely. Um, my mom in 2011 had a fatal heart attack the night before Mother's Day. Um, and I did not set out to write a book about her with this book. I, I, I was trying to write a book about coming of age, um, masculinity, um, which I you know, just feel is uh, something we have to interrogate. Our lives depend on interrogating masculinity in this country right now. Um, and you know, my mother was a part of the coming of age story. Um, but she, as she was in life, <laughs> uh, exploded on the page. She was so important. And, and it just began to feel sexist, frankly, um, to write about her and then leave, you know? Um, and, and my editor at Simon & Schuster, John Cox, very compassionately um, pushed me to, to write the full story about her passing away, um, which was very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, what I realized over the process of writing the book is, you know, when we are fighting for our lives, um, we aren't the only ones doing it. We are all fighting for our lives together, right? It is difficult to be a man in America. It is difficult to be a gay black man in America, but it is certainly difficult to be, you know, a woman or to be the mother of that person. Um, and, and so that's how she figured into the book. Mm. It's very powerful. 
So the book description says that at age 12, you were a bookish black boy from Texas on the cusp of your first classroom crush. But instead, your crush becomes the first person to call you faggot. In the book, you write the, about this moment, um, uh, and you say, in its way, um, it makes you. It becomes the spine for the body of anxieties and insecurities that will follow, which is just such a phenomenal way of saying so much, <laughs> so concisely. Um, and I get it. I mean, really, that's just so powerful. And, you know, in, you know, three minutes, can you talk about your entire life of uh, anxieties and insecurities? <laughs> Is my therapist <laughs> here? Oh, David, I think I, um, no, I mean, you know, I, I, I think I, I learned so much from the, the, I knew what the story was, I knew the facts, but you know, you learn so much from, from really writing and revising your own story. Um, we haunt ourselves. I think when, when, when we think about oppression, when we think about bullying, harassment in the workplace, in our lives, in our families, the truth is that, you know, maybe there are a handful of incidents where someone says or does the awful thing, right? And, and I hope that doesn't happen, but it does. But, but there are far more moments where we are thinking it ourselves. You know, um, I was not like there, there's, there are no moments in the book where I'm like bullied at school. I'm not being like shoved in the locker or, or anything like that, pushed around. You know, I was bullying myself. Um, and, and so when Cody, the, the boy that, you, that you're mentioning, um, calls me a faggot, um, I felt I was angry, <laughs> um, but I felt a brief moment of relief. Someone finally said it. The passive aggression, the euphemisms, all the other like sideways glances, all the, you know, I'm not sitting at your lunch table today, all of those things, you know, someone just finally said the thing that was creating this distance between me and former friends. And, and I think that is true for, for so many of us. Um, and, and what happens basically over the process of the book um, into my early 20s is that that silence, that self-bullying coalesced um, and to violent self-hatred. I don't want to end on this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we almost have to, but if you might quickly just uh, give us the transition of um, who are some authors that you looked at when you were yeah. writing this, or perhaps any authors. Oh my gosh, yeah. so many people, right? Like writing's just elevated reading. Uh, Mary Carr. Absolutely. Uh, Casey Lehman um, is, is just, he's just so, a wonderful person. Um, Jackie Woodson, um, Patricia Smith, just, you know, part of it was, you know, part of this book is how writing and reading saved my life, right? And how I continually return to it. So part of it was like, yes, studying the craft of other writers, but it was also looking at people who have lived deeply and are still telling their story, right? And, and looking to them for hope. Um, and going well, they're they're here, you know. I mean, heavy is is not an easy book, right? He Casey does he does not have an easy story, but he is here, and he is still telling stories. Um, so uh, he was really important, and and Toni Morrison, of course. Um, just the the idea of of writing a book um, to to answer a question, you know. And and I think for me, in part, it was like you know, I I, I didn't think of myself as a victim. I was really angry. I didn't want to be like, you know, like a sissy faggot, like, oh, please feel sorry for me. And then I became a victim. Um, so what do, what do you do with that? And, and, and how do you work through that experience um, and then make it to the love on the other side? That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are going to move on and talk a little bit with Laura Prescott. Uh, uh, and I re just realized you probably don't know where you are in the alphabet. I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Surprise. It's, yeah. Um, so Laura's novel is a historic novel called The Secrets We Kept. Uh, she grew up in western Pennsylvania and studied political science at American University in Washington, D.C., and international development in Namibia and South Africa. In 2018, she received her MFA from the Mishner Center for Writers at the University of Texas in Austin and uh, as the Fan Fa Fania? Fania Kruger Fellow. Laura's short stories have been published in the Southern Review, the Hudson Review, Crazy Horse, BuzzFeed, Day One, and Tin House Flash Friday. She was the finalist for the 2017 Keene Prize for Fiction and winner of the 2016 Crazy Horse Fiction Prize. 
Prior to writing fiction, Laura worked as a political campaign consultant, and she currently lives in Austin, Texas with her husband. The Secrets She Kept is her debut novel. It is historical, um, and uh, it, it looks at the lives of some people, some women, who had a lot to do with Boris Pasternak's book. Can you, can you just briefly describe the, your book? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I started writing this book based on my name, which is Lara, which is the heroine of Dr. Zhivago. So anytime I heard anything about Dr. Zhivago, I was just fascinated. I read the book. I've seen David Lean's amazing film. And a couple years ago, it was 2014, my father sent me an article that said how the CIA had used Dr. Zhivago as a tool of propaganda during the Cold War. And I just was fascinated with how a book could be used as a weapon. Um, I, as working in politics, I learned how to use words. I tw ghost tweeted for politicians and wrote speeches for politicians. And I was fascinated with how words can change the hearts and minds of people for better, for worse. And so the thought that a book could do this and that the CIA thought it was so important to take this book that was banned in the Soviet Union, print it, and smuggle it back behind the Iron Curtain to show the Soviet citizens that their government is keeping this work of art from them. And that was the mission. And so I'm reading all these redacted documents on CIA's website that they released. Um, and I kept thinking about who was typing these documents and who knew, knew what all the redactions were, kind of like the, knew the secrets of the secret keepers. And so the typists who open my book are a group of women that their voice just came to me so strong and all of a sudden I never believed when writers said that happened to them because it had never happened to me before but it came to me in the middle of the night and I texted myself like the opening of the book. And so I just learned so much about these fascinating women who worked at the CIA who came from places like Vassar and Smith but really when they got there they only could become secretaries or clerks. So half of my story is told from that perspective um, and some of the women who later become spies for the mission. But then the more I read about it, the more I learned about Boris Pasternak and what was going on on the persecution he was facing in the Soviet Union. I mean, he won the Nobel Prize and had to turn it down. And I just thought I, I needed to know the whole story. And I was most fascinated about his mistress and muse, who was the inspiration for Lara and Dr. Zhivago. Her name is Olga. And Olga actually went to the Gulag twice um, to punish Boris and to ask if she, she could tell what this novel he was writing was about, because they feared it. And I was fascinated with her heroic story. And I really, and hers was a story that the, has been kind of hidden for a long time. No one wanted to hear the voice of this, this mistress, this adulteress, and, and she just really inspired me to, to write her story, too. Yeah. Well, you know, it, um, I think historical novels um, based on you know, specific characters, not necessarily um, big historic periods, are, are uh, very popular right now, speaking as a bookseller. And um, the, uh, yours, like some others, but uh, you know, I find you so fascinating that they're centering women in these, uh, in you know, as the point, as the kind of the focus of the of the novel, and um, those are the stories that we haven't heard. Like everybody knows Boris Pasternak and knows kind of what the big, you know, picture of that. But that we, you are basically bringing to life these women who made a great deal of difference and made the history happen um, and, you know, are having the, the adventure, you know, the adventure story in this book is women. The, Sally Forrester is a former OSS agent mm -hmm. and Irina Drozdova was a Russian immigrant. Mm -hmm. um, can you uh, share a little bit about their personalities and, and what they were? Yeah, doing? so these two women are based in fiction, but based from real life accounts of women who worked at the early CIA. Sally in particular, she was in the field with men fighting the resistance in World War II. And these women who after the war, um, if they transitioned to the CIA, were then put behind the desk. 
So these, these are heroic women that led resistance fighters across the borders that planted bombs and blew up bridges. And women like Virginia Hall, who I mention in, in the book, and there's a great book that just came out called A Woman of No Importance, a nonfiction book about Virginia. But she is one of the inspirations behind a Sally Forrester character. And Sally um, is this woman who is this you know, very glamorous, gorgeous woman who uses her sexuality to get secrets out of men, but takes back that sexuality from their power that they think they have over her, because she's the one that has the power in the situation. And Arena is kind of the, my character that's a newcomer um, to the CIA who learns to be a carrier, which is one of the jobs that early CIA women could have, because they could just blend in, and no one would think of the woman sitting on the bus as someone who's carrying these secrets. Um, and I always, Dr. Zhivago is one of the greatest love stories of all time. I wanted to write about these, the love story between Olga and Boris, but also between these two women. Um, and I didn't want to write a good guy, bad guy, east, west story. The CIA, um, I wanted to take on for the things that they did and how they fired people because of their sexuality. And this, that's another kind of unfolding story during the Lavender Scare in the 1950s that went all the way up until, I mean, today even, really. Yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed. It, yeah, it's, it's just promises to be um, a really wonderful read. I can't wait to get the rest of it. Um, thank you. So, Kylie Reed is next in the alphabet. Uh, <laughs> Hi. <laughs> and, um, you know, the bio I have on you is basically in your words, um, and I feel like I would like to give those words to you instead of just tell you what you said. <laughs> um, okay. But uh, Kylie's book is a bit of a ripped from the headlines seeming story called Such a Fun Age. It is a novel based on life, um, kind of like all novels. I mean, you've, you've used a lot of your own experience to, uh, you know these people really well. Um, can you uh, tell us a little bit about your background that you drew on to create this novel? Sure, um, thank you for having me. I was a nanny for six years here in New York City, and I also worked at a, I don't know if you guys have been to those like birthday party factories where they just usher kids in, happy birthday, and then they rush them out. Um, I worked at there and I did about eight birthday parties a week, and so that was my life, just being in and out of families and sometimes feeling like part of the family and sometimes being very frustrated that um, our relationship was so precarious and so from there I went to graduate school where I became really obsessed with class dynamics how the affluent don't think they're affluent and how people don't want to talk about money how they're talking about money when they're not talking about money and so this book is a marriage between those class dynamics and my love for child care so it's really fascinating I know some of you heard a bit of the set up for this book yesterday, but it involves um, an African-American nanny who's asked to take her white young charge to um, out of the house for a brief m moment. The parents need to deal with something, but she, um, uh, the grocery store security guard um, decides that she's actually kidnapped this child. So that kind of, the, it starts off right away with this like really amazing scene and um, you're pulled right in and uh, but, the, and, but there's a lot else that winds up happening in this story. And um, one of the things I was struck by, I wonder if you could talk about a little, is you've really um, written the story from a lot of points of view. It's not just that young woman's uh, brush with um, just casual racism. It, you've got all of the characters kind of, you get inside of all of their heads. And how, why did you decide to write it that way? Uh, well, I think also just to be clear, this is not autobiographical at right. all. <laughs> I have a lot of mothers texting me like, Kylie, is this book about me? I have a career I need to know <laughs> if you're writing this book about me. <laughs> it's not. Um, I think I saw that, I mean, when I was babysitting, the family dynamics, they're all, whether they're doing it the right way, are trying their very, very best. Um, no one gets away with their hands clean in this novel. And I also would love for people to come away realizing that 
privilege and whiteness is never skin deep. It goes beyond skin to class and, and background. And so I think I wanted to treat each character with empathy. And when I did that, and when I gave each character a little bit of a win, I think that's when they came alive for me. And, you know, I'm just wondering if you've thought, well, maybe now you're starting to hear from people, but um, the, I'm also thinking about the readers, how the demographics of the readers could possibly, like, see things really differently in your book, depending on which side of the story they kind of, what feels the most familiar or the most, makes them the most nervous or confirms something. Have you, um, had those conversations with anyone or any, you thought about that at all? Um, I think that the fact that there's a video in the grocery store, someone films the scene, I think that that kind of encapsulates each view. There's the person making the assumption, the person who's taking it, and then the person who's watching and what to do. And it's that all too familiar video that you see circulating around Twitter and you maybe watch it, you maybe don't. Um, I do teach at the University of Iowa and all of my students are white and I think that I'm, I'm the only black person that they know and for them, this sounds crazy, but it's the technology that they're fascinated by and I think we've all been in those positions, that, that little gut feeling of, oh shoot, do I pull my phone out right now? Mm -hmm. Is this an event right now? Mm -hmm. So I think that that will allow a, diff a lot of different audiences to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I just think they might, it'd be really, I'm really curious to see what that enjoyment looks like. For I am too. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you, what did, what did you, if, if, if this is the right question, but you can redirect it, um, kind of learn from putting this story together? Um, I mean, I, especially because I have such a big history with babysitting, I really learned that readers will see themselves in different people and never the person that they, they think they are <laughs> at all. They'll be like, is this me? I'm like, mm-hmm, that's, that's <laughs> um, I think that I learned a lot about family from this story. Um, I think I also learned, like, as a writer, to just my one of my mentors, Jess Walters, always says to just follow your obsessions. And this novel really gave me the freedom to talk about wealth and money because it affects our lives so much. And so I think it helped me skip that embarrassing, like, oh, you can't talk about this ghost topic thing. And no, I want to talk about money, and I want my characters to do it. And I also think it showed me that writers of fiction can have a perspective on politics as well. And sometimes I think that fiction kind of does what the think piece and the essay can't do. Um, the first goal is that people love the story, but obviously I don't want to read anything unless it makes me think about the world we live in. So I'm hoping it does that too. Oh, I think it will. I think that will. Thank you. Thank you. So um, Kate Elizabeth Russell is originally from Eastern Maine and holds a PhD in creative writing from the University of Kansas and an MFA from Indiana University. Her work has appeared in Haven's Ferry Review, Mid-American Review, and Quarterly West, among other journals, and has been nominated for a Pushcart Prize. She currently lives in Madison, Wisconsin, and this is, astonishingly, her first novel. It is called My Dark Vanessa. Uh, those of you who were at the buzz, editor's buzz yesterday know um, what a uh, brave and delicate topic this book covers um, involving a uh, teacher at a private girls high school who is an older man and uh, the news breaks that he's been accused of um, sexually abusing a uh, student and um, the main <coughs> character is an adult woman who had a relationship with him when she was a student there. So um, a very um, brave topic and beautifully, beautifully done. So can, um, I know you started writing this book at a very young age mm -hmm. and you were discouraged from writing it at various points in writing school. Um, I'm encapsulating it to writing school. Um, <laughs> Can you talk about why, why you kept it up, why you started, and why you managed to, um, despite all odds, get your book out? 
Sure. Um, yeah, I started writing these characters when I was 16. Um, and when I say that, I always feel this, like, I don't know, obligation to sort of dismiss my 16-year-old self, like, oh, but it was really bad, or that I didn't know what I was doing at that age. And, but that's not true. Like, I did, I did know what I was doing. I just didn't have the skills at that age, writer-wise, to execute the story that I sort of had the, the germ of or the seed of in my head. Um, and I really started writing the story when I was 16 as a way to try to understand my place in the world. I, I remember observing not just the way that older men had started to treat me, but also how they started to treat my friends and just that sort of discomfort that you feel as you're coming of age and the whole world just starts to treat you differently. And um, so that's where it sort of originated. That's where it started from. And I was just a kid writing stories. Um, but I loved it. It was what I loved to do most in the world. So um, I went to college as an undergrad and I studied creative writing there. I went into an MFA program and then eventually got a PhD in creative writing. And I mean, it made people uncomfortable. And it's, you know, uncomfortable subject matter when you're writing about sexual abuse. But at the same time, it, it, pe Sometimes I found myself frustrated with people's discomfort, or especially if people said, like, no one's going to want to read this. No one's going to want to engage with this. Um, because that just seemed like another way to silence this story, because it happens. And it's something that um, we all are connected to, even if this didn't you know, happen to you. If, if you weren't a victim of sexual abuse, you probably know someone who was, or um, maybe you know someone who was a perpetrator, or, or we all are complicit in, in this because it's so baked into our culture. And so that the, the people's discomfort or their refusal to engage with the story that I was writing that I knew in my heart was important, that, um, yeah, it was it was frustrating, but I think I maybe turned that frustration into um, just determination and and perseverance. Um, I didn't know if it would ever be published, or certainly be published. At, you know, it's sold in a lot of countries. <laughs> like it's going to be published around the world, which is um, baffling to me. And I had, of course, no idea that that was going to happen. But I knew that I was committed in my heart to tell this story, and that's. Um, why I didn't give up for 18 years. I was working on it. Well, and I'm, I'm glad you didn't give up. And I think the story, as far as I've been able to um, read it, uh, has you've done a really masterful job of the, the nuanced, all the layers of this and how the complexities of this kind of um, experience and subject. It's, it's not just like a, a, a newspaper account by any means. Um, it's emotionally rich and uh, full. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, the public conversation on the subject has certainly shifted in the last mm -hmm. couple of years quite a bit. And did um, your understanding of your book shift in any way? Or how was that conversation, how did that affect um, your, your book or your understanding of it? Sure, yeah. I mean, when I first started working on this story, it was just about the girl and her teacher, and it was very much her story, and it still is. Um, but as the cultural conversation shifted towards um, speaking out, like victims stepping forward and speaking out, which didn't start with me too, like that that's something that's been building for years, and I started to see these stories come out, and, and it, it, that worked its way into the novel, and that's when this plot line emerged of another former student coming forward and accusing this teacher of abuse, and that sets up the conflict right away, because Vanessa, the protagonist, she saw this relationship as love. It wasn't abuse, it was love, um, and this other student coming forward who reaches out to Vanessa um, forces her to rethink, to rethink everything, and that's a conflict that um, I think is there, I, but it's not a neat story. It's certainly not a story that would fit into um, a thousand word you know, news article. And it's, um, it's a messy, 
you know, the type of point of view to have if you look back on a relationship that you had when you were 15 with an adult and you don't want to say that you were a victim, you don't want to say it was bad, you want to cling to that um, belief that it was love. People don't necessarily want to hear that. They want to hear the neat uh, sort of um, narrative that has a clear um, villain and a clear a clear victim. Um, so in that way, I think a novel is the is the right way to explore explore this story. Yes, I, I agree, and thank you for writing it. Um, so we're going to uh, wrap up our bookends here with Anna Weiner and her book Uncanny Valley. Um, Anna's work has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic, New York, Harper's, The New Republic, N Plus One and online at The New Yorker, as well as in Best American Non-Required Reading 2017. She lives in San Francisco and still, it says still, uh, works <laughs> at a tech company. Uncanny Valley is her first book. It is memoir um, and uh, talks about her experience, well, basically, in, in um, Silicon Valley, going, you know, behind the scenes, in all of its many layers. I, I really loved the writing. Um, this description, this is one of the descriptions, unsparing and vulnerable, darkly humorous and fiercely intelligent, Anna Wiener's memoir is both a coming of age story and an unprecedented and prescient exploration of the consequences, consequences of the digital age. Um, so, so you went inside, <laughs> and you're still there, and you, in 2016 you wrote an essay for N Plus One that sort of broke the internet and then became um, this book. So, you know, so much of our lives is directed by Silicon Valley, and, and um, I think in your book it makes it very clear how, how much, you know, how invisible that is, but how pervasive it is, and you so beautifully describe, like, these nerdy, you know, <laughs> hipster, um, tech geeky people who are doing all this work. Um, can you can you talk about why you decided to write about it? Um, sure. Thank you for the generous summary. <laughs> um, I never intended to write about the tech industry. Um, I joined a startup in 2013 at the beginning of the year that was um, doing a sort of Netflix for ebooks product, although we were sort of forbidden from saying Netflix for ebooks. Um, <laughs> but I was really just looking for meaning in work and for um, some way to sort of find my place in the world, and tech has a really good story about itself. Um, I should say I no longer work in the industry. I left at the beginning of 2018 um, when the sort of writing life and the tech life seemed no longer compatible. Um, but I decided to write about it. I guess it never, I never considered the workplace to be, for me at least, like a um, subject of intellectual inquiry or uh, a site of human drama. But of course, it is one of the, I think, most fruitful sites of human drama. And in Silicon Valley, the, you have ambition. You have all of these young people who have dedicated their, um, their 20s to building products and doing things really quickly. and. Um, they're sort of beholden to the market in a certain way. And I just thought that the, when I landed in San Francisco in 2013, that um, there just were all these stories about what was happening to that city and um, what the new economy looked like in a sort of uh, pre-Me Too <laughs> era, um, post-recession, post-9-11, and um, Patriot Act sort of surveillance state. So it just sort of revealed to me as a very rich environment to write about, um, but I never, it, it came out of a series of emails that I wrote to my friend Dana Tortorici at N Plus One that were just intended to entertain her. Um, and that turned into a sort of fictionalized essay for N Plus One, and then I just realized there was so much more material. So um, did folks know that you were writing about them when you started uh, turn, turning it into a book, or? Um, some did. The the N plus one piece came out in early 2016, and um, I started writing for the New Yorker website about Silicon Valley culture. Um, and people in general either didn't notice or were, um, my coworkers were excited that people were paying attention 
to the to the industry and, and giving it some texture rather than the sort of like buoyant pieces and triumphalist narratives um, or the very cynical you know smartphones are ruining our children sort of thing mm -hmm. so um, no one has contacted me from like the executive tier <laughs> uh, so I guess we'll see, we'll see how people feel about that mm -hmm. so t can you Tell us a little bit, um, maybe some uh, something that was a bit of a surprise for you um, when you entered that world and um, that maybe isn't um, very obvious to someone who isn't inside of it. Oh. I mean, you probably <laughs> um, <many> minutes, <laughs> Well, I have 300 pages. You yeah. Can. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think for me, I knew going in that I would be... Um, one of very few women. I was the fourth woman at a company of 20, uh, which was a pretty good ratio, actually, all things considered, um, given that it was a, a very technical company. Um, I think just what that feels like on a day-to-day -day basis, I was not prepared for, especially coming from an industry like publishing, where I worked in an office of all women. And um, I just how to negotiate that and navigate that and um, just the sort of emotional experience of it. I think also what I, what shocked me was the level of um, surveillance that employees have when people are using their products, just the sort of access and permission that people have internally to see how people are using tech products. And that was very alarming to mm -hmm. me. Indeed, so do you have any um, kind of cautionary uh, words for us? Um, <laughs> Um, uh, based, based on this knowledge? <laughs> you signal, you tour. Um, I, think, <laughs> I think that cautionary, no. I mean, I, I, I'm not someone who should give anybody advice, but um, I do think that we're in a moment where the industry is getting a lot more scrutiny, and deservedly so, and um, I, just, I guess I would encourage people to pay attention, and if something feels strange, as it seems like uh, Rob's book maybe details. <laughs> um, there's probably very good reason. So, yeah, I I would just say you know, I don't know, pay attention and um, and push back if it starts to feel overreaching. Okay. Um, uh, it, yeah, your book is very much like a a, a a lived journalism experience, and the writing is very lively and um, is as much. I think a, almost a character in the in the narration as the, the characters themselves. Very enjoyable. Thank you. Um, we did it. <laughs> we yeah. did it. It says time's up. This is it. exactly <laughs> the right time. I, I'd love to give you, all of you way more time. They're Thank great you. books. Thank you.